if you were looking for meaningful diversification away from stocks and bonds three years ago, based upon what you were seeing and in reality, that you should be looking even harder today. So if we, let's get in our time machine and go back to the beginning of the year and said, this, these are my expectations for the year. I think stocks are going to, US stocks are going to be up 30, gold's going to be down, bonds are going to be down. You know, global stocks would be up 22 or whatever. And you, you would have gotten punched in the face by most people. I think you would have lost a lot of credibility saying, and then also tell them that, you know, COVID and all this other stuff, lockdowns, like it would get worse and worse and worse. No, it's uh, again, I've seen this over the last 24 years where what you end up getting tends to be very dissimilar to what was um, acceptable mentally at the beginning of the year. So we just closed out the second year of running the fund. Can you share some insights of the differences between year one and year two at standpoint? It's damn near impossible to raise money for a brand new fund. You know, it's just truly just friends and family in that first year. So, which I think explains why we only had 26 or $27 million at the end of the first year. Um, it's nobody buys new funds. Uh, but if, if the fund actually does meet an unmet need in the marketplace um, and the outcome is decent, Going into the second year, oftentimes you can exponentially increase your assets, especially in the second half of the second year. And that's exactly what happened is we got good results in the first year um, and we got fairly good results in the first half of the, of the second year. And we started to see adoption of the fund, you know, our messaging and the, the, you know, why we put the fund together and what role it serves in the advisor's portfolio started to become clearer to people. So you know, finishing this year at about 160 million, that's where we're at right now. Um, that's pretty good. And that's 500% growth over the end of last year. It was a very small base of 27 million, um, but it's, it's good growth. And, and it's coming from lots of different advisors. It's not just one or two big clients and people can see how it fits into their portfolio and what problems it solves. And you've actually delivered meaning that, you know, they're not confused. Um, Again, your, max, your actions match your words uh, and you get through the annual distribution and they can see that the fee is real. Uh, they can get a feel for what the taxes are they can get a feel for what your beta and correlation are to, to stocks. Um, in the third year, there, people are in a position to have enough data to start making decisions about real allocations. Okay, so you keep talking about actions matching your words and that that's what's getting people comfortable with the fund. But what does that really mean? You know, why do you think advisors and investors have been allocating to us? I think advisors have been buying the fund because the fund, the fund meets an unmet need in the marketplace that they have. Something that has a good shot at being competitive with equities during a bull market, um, but also has the ability to diversify into things that are totally unrelated to equities. You know, one of our largest positions right now are carbon emission credits out of, out of uh, Europe. Uh, it's been a very profitable position, a very uncorrelated with equities and just fundamentally very different. Uh, we did very well uh, with our macro positions in energy markets, <clears throat> both during COVID last year, but also during the recovery this year. Um, so, advisors so far that they like the diversification because um, not too many people trust bonds to be able to generate a real rate of return going forward. I mean, inflation six and bond yields are one and a half. I mean, you can see the writing on the wall. So you have to go somewhere. You have to do something and capturing the risk transfer risk premium in the, in the futures markets in commodities like grains and soft commodities and energy and metals, um, it just makes sense for people, especially in an inflationary environment. So I think advisors have looked at what we do, found us to be compelling and competitive and have allocated money. And I hope that continues. Yeah, you're not going to get any resistance from me on that one. Um, but kind of on a more serious note, I, I talk to advisors all day long and they're sitting there telling me how hard or painful diversification can be to fit into a portfolio because you got all these different moving parts that are going on. So why do you feel like what we're offering is actually solving problems? It, it always amazes me how the individual components themselves are incredibly painful. 
So like, like I said, if we took our fund and we broke it out and we showed each line item to people they, every single day, every week, every month, they would find something to be upset about. But that's the nature of diversification. Like if everything went up and down together, you wouldn't be diversified. So we've got the macro portion. And then we've got just the equities portion. And then we've got the cash management portion. And then you can take the macro portion and you can break it up into metals, grains, energy, soft commodities, bonds, so on and so forth. Each one of those individual pieces is very painful because they move very differently from the stock market. Um, you know, they, they can have drawdowns, be out of favor for months. Um, and also those, those positions that don't move differently from the stock market, just being long stocks like equity beta is painful too. You know, on, on our equity positions last year during COVID, you know, we were down 33%, just like everyone else on our dedicated long only equity positions. Um, what saved us was the diversifying nature of all the other stuff going on in the portfolio, or the individual pieces of the macro strategy, and which is the job of the macro portfolio. So yeah, there's a lot of pain in there individually, but something happens when you wrap them all up into, into one portfolio, you get the benefits of portfolio theory. You know, so all we're doing is implementing modern portfolio theory, but taking it to its natural conclusion by including all of the assets and strategies that are truly diversifying in nature rather than excluding them. So we just simply include them and bring them in. I hear you. Your strategy over there sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> but uh, being that this is a year interview style video, uh, can you talk about like, where we made money, where we lost money, any relevant themes in the portfolio? Most of the gains that we've realized mm -hmm so far this year, or not realized, but experienced so far this year, primarily came from long positions in global equities. So, and I'm including US equities. I mean, it just, it is what it is. You know, we have, um, we always have a dedicated long position or a long sleeve to market cap weighted, low fee, low tax global equities. And we've made, uh, we've enjoyed pretty, pretty solid gains from those this year. Beyond that, we've, um, had pretty large gains in energy markets. Um, as you guys know, we were short energy during COVID and that's, that's where most of the, most of the buffering or the, or the risk mitigation came from was being short energy during, during COVID. Uh, there were a couple other sectors that contributed, but in, in a marginal way, it was mostly short energy, but in this year, 2021, uh, it was from being long energy markets. You know, there was an overreaction a cut in production um, and capital that was scared to go into uh, the energy industry. So when you see that, uh, oftentimes you'll get a big trend and it'll go on for a long time until people capitulate and stop being scared to provide capital to, to a, a malnourished industry. Uh, so energy was a classic example of that kind of overreaction. Um, we don't trade based upon the fundamentals. Um, we don't trade very much, you know, we're just basically trying to not be on the wrong side of big trends and hold our winners and apply good money management principles to holding those winners and controlling our risk. And that worked out for us in the energy sector. Beyond energy, we made uh, pretty healthy returns also in grains, mostly on the upside. Um, we're kind of short grains right now, but during calendar year 2021, it was mostly being long grains. Uh, the only sector that cost us money was the bond sector. You know, we were primarily short uh, bonds and they did go down, but because of the term structure and some of the erratic nature of the way bonds went down, we ended up uh, harvesting small losses on bonds. Um, two themes that don't seem to be going away, it's inflation and bond returns. Uh, I know you have some opinions there. I don't know that. Let's just say that the five-year treasury yield and inflation, um, you got compensated or let's go shorter term, let's say one-year T-bills. You know, the, the yield you got from one-year T-bills was generally compensated you for the bulk of whatever inflation was happening. Uh, that doesn't seem to be true today. You know, the inflation numbers I'm seeing are five or 6%, and that, that's coming from the government. So if you ask people that are actually um, feeling the effects of inflation, there's a lot of people out there smarter than me that feel like inflation is more like eight to 12%. So I won't get into the political debate around that, but 
needless to say, it, whatever the real inflation rate is, it's a lot higher than the one-year T-bill rate. And that is anomalous. That, that's a new phenomenon. I do remember he created that bond simulator back in 2020. Uh, what was the purpose behind making that thing? Right. So I created that bond simulator in August of 2020, I believe. So we put it out on our website and it was just an attempt to empower advisors to look at the realistic potential outcomes for the 10-year treasury bond going forward, which is kind of the bellwether benchmark for bond investing. And I wanted people to, to be able to see what I see, that given where interest rates are and given where inflation was at the time, I think it was two two and a half percent was the inflation rate at the time. Um, I wanted them to be able to, you know, crunch through the mathematics of bonds and just look at, you know, like a, like a scatter plot of uh, what the potential realistic outcomes are for holding, you know, long positions in, in bonds going forward. Cause I felt like if they could see that, that it would be easier to set expectations with clients primarily um, but also to see just how poor of an investment choice, at least on an absolute return basis, bonds are going forward. I mean, look, there are times when reality simply imposes its will on you. There are times where you've painted yourself into a corner and it, it's possible to make money. It's just incredibly unlikely. And even if you do, it's, it's not very much. Yeah, that simulator thing is pretty cool. If you're one of the seven people watching this, you should check it out. Um, and, and I hear you on the case against bonds, but to be fair, 90% of alts or active management out there hasn't been very impressive lately. But certainly less attractive than bonds over the past decade. So why do you have any confidence that our solution will be any different? I've looked at the data every which way I possibly can for almost a quarter of a century. And I've analyzed every investable asset class, whether it's through um, futures contracts, forward contracts, ETFs, common stocks, MLPs, preferred shares, hedge funds, SMAs, insurance products, variable annuities. I've looked at everything I can think of um, with a database designer's perspective. Um, and I've simulated and back-tested hundreds of different approaches over the decades. And there's a precious few that stand out to me as something that I would expect, or that I think is a good bet that I would say, I'll put my mom's money in this. I'll put my money in this. It's not guaranteed to work, but I think it's a good expected value bet. And it makes sense. It's good business judgment to do that. Um, and what we did is, is take all of those things and put them in one fund. Uh, so let's wrap this up. Uh, now that 2021 is behind us, do you have any comments for the year ahead? Um, as we go on to 2022, the motivations that I see from advisors, that I've seen from advisors over the past three years are just more relevant. You know, if they felt like stocks were certainly not undervalued two years ago and one year ago, um, well, they're probably not feeling that stocks are undervalued today. Um, the bond problem hasn't meaningfully changed at all. So if anything, I would say that if there was demand for an alternative that you can actually get behind, um, an acceptable alternative that doesn't turn your practice upside down or drive your clients crazy, if there was demand for that two years ago, there's probably a lot more demand for it today. I think. Now, people sometimes need their feet held to the fire before they make a change. Like they need the stock market to go down. But I think there's also a large group of people that are somewhat proactive. Like they're looking at it and they're saying, you know, I just don't want to have 60 or 70 or 50% of my money in equities or my client's money in equities anymore. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be because they think the equity market's going to go down. It could be that their clients are just four years older than they were four years ago. And it doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, and equity beta, even though it's free and it's tax efficient, it is not low risk. And everyone knows this. So, yeah, I would say that, you know, if you were looking for 
meaningful diversification away from stocks and bonds three years ago based upon what you were seeing and in reality that you should be looking even harder today.